the bleak midwinter all creation grows for a world in darkness grows in like a storm light is breaking in a stable for a throne and he shall reign forevermore forevermore and he If I were a wise man, I would travel far. If I were a shepherd, I would do my part, the poor as I am. I will give to him my heart, and he shall reign forever. Into our hopes, into our fears, the Savior of the world appears, the promise of eternal years, Christ the Messiah, and He shall reign forevermore, forevermore, and He So we're singing about a child in a manger and wise men and shepherds. It's not Christmas today. Now the first line worked out pretty well in the bleak midwinter. I mean, I, there's a little bit of uh, pre-planning there, I think. Um, why are we singing that song today? Because when Jesus came, he came as Messiah. It's a, it's a Jewish word that means the, the king they were waiting for, they were hoping for, and he shall reign. Now, those aren't words that we use when we think about our leaders very much. We think about presidents and governors and elected officials, and they serve. They're in office, but they don't reign. Now, I would venture to say, you don't have to agree with me on this, I would venture to say the best kind of government would be one with an all-powerful king who was completely good and knew us all individually and loved us all individually. Well, as we gather in a church that claims Jesus Christ as Messiah, that's what we're proclaiming. We have one king who knows us and loves us and is all-powerful God who is with us. Would you stand this morning and listen to these words that Jesus spoke at different times through his ministry? 
At one point he said, let the little children come to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as them. Another time he said, come all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then as he thinks about those he calls, he also sends. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus reigns. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who's at work in your hearts and in your lives. Amen. Let's take a moment this morning and greet those around us and extend that welcome of God's people to one another. Let us come together and worship. Please join me. O magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. We will give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole heart. We will tell of all your wonderful deeds. We will be glad and exalt in you. We will sing praise to your name, O Lord. O oh, church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies.
and cheaters in their houses and associated regularly with the others, the untouchables of society. What does this tell you your ministry on earth should look like? The story of Zacchaeus is one of these. Jesus singled out this man who was reviled by his community for stealing from them and befriending him. Upon visiting with Zacchaeus, Jesus' life was changed. Meeting Jesus was so powerful and effective. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, for the Lord he wanted to see. And as a Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus knew that he'd done wrong, and sorry for his sins was he. Lord, to the poor I'll give one half of all my good, said he. And if I've cheated anyone, for times will I repay. Jesus said, Salvation has come to you. I have come to seek and save. I have come to seek and save. Jesus. Don't worry, it is not with your own power that you do these things. It is with the power promised you by Jesus, the one who proved he is stronger than death. Lord, may your spirit encourage and minister to us and equip us for this service. Yes, my mind to Calvary. His body bowed and 
God's Word, the Bible, has so many things to teach us that we can be learning different things week by week, year after year after year. In fact, uh, people every once in a while say, well, you should preach about this. And the funny thing is, you know that I probably have about two and a half years of sermon series in my head because God's Word has so much. And yet, every time we gather, it is good, it is right I almost say it's necessary for us to remember the basic story. God saw us in our sin. He loved us in Jesus. Sent him as a babe. Sent him to the cross. And raised him from the dead. One way we proclaim that message is through what we call sacrament. God's sign pointing to what he has done in Jesus and a seal giving something to us of his authority and his strength. This morning we have opportunity towards the end of our service to come to the Lord's table, to receive bread and juice, but in receiving that, understand that we are remembering what Jesus has done, but we are also receiving Christ, a gift from God to us. This, we receive that gift through our faith, And so we ask that as you consider participating today, that you have a faith in Jesus Christ. And you have proclaimed that faith by your membership in a church. And by the way, I'm messing up the uh, PowerPoint people. I'm going to do the community connections, and then we're going to do the congregational prayer, because I'd rather talk about it and then pray about it. So so that's the first thing. Second thing, um, just over a week ago, we had a leadership retreat, started talking about directions of ministries, and some of the things we did is we said, hey, we've been talking about what it is to be a missional church for a very long time. And there are probably some bigger, deeper changes, structural changes we need to do to to make some of that happen better. We've been, hey, we've been having goals and reaching those goals, and they've been pointing in this direction, and some of those things are going really well. But some of it, to get to that next step, we probably need to take a little bit bigger step. And so... um, council has asked us to put together a group of seven that um, is going to kind of lead lead the council through writing out a proposal to keep us moving in that direction. So I want you to know what's going on with that. You'll keep hearing things about that. Uh, One of the things, though, is um, hopefully you'll notice, if you don't notice, and I'm not doing a very good job, uh, hopefully you'll notice a little shift in preaching. It's my tendency, and I'm good at it. I'm a coach. I'm good at saying this is what we need to do and how we need to do it. But at some point in time, we need to just kind of live with this. This is who we are in Jesus Christ. This is what he has done for us. And as we hopefully are gathering people in who haven't lived with that message in their life their whole lives, they don't need to hear how we're supposed to act as a church. They need to hear 
How does Christ love us? And now the truth is that also has an awful lot to say about how we act. But hopefully you're going to see a little bit of that shift um, coming around the next few weeks and absolutely by Easter, clearly. Because yeah, we're in the middle of a series in Acts, and Acts does say a lot about what are we supposed to do as a church. And that's, that's what the book's about, right? So that's um, that one. Let's see. Um, third one, uh, check your bulletins. Um, we have agreed to take on three weeks of providing child care for the Thursday night uh, loving help program through Love in the Name of Christ. And uh, I know Lorna knows those weeks. Um, start thinking about if you can give, how long? Hour and a half? Hour and a half, Hour and a half on a Thursday night to uh, take care of that role. Um, she'll have that. But just start thinking about that and see if that's uh, something you can do on a Thursday night. And then... Um, Finally, I need to share with you, too, um, Keith Van Drager's mom, Thelma, passed away uh, yesterday. Uh, they haven't been able to make their funeral plans yet. So um, keep Keith and uh, Marsha and their family in your prayers. But also, uh, when we get the information in, we'll send it out by email. You can always check, you know, the uh, funeral home websites or KIWA and find that information. Um, but uh, we'll get that out as soon as we can. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord God, you have called us, you have invited us to come as your children, as your family, your daughters, your sons. Lord, whether we are little children or whether we are weak and weary and heavy laden, Lord, you call us to be yours. So, Lord, we lift our prayers to you today. Lord, we lift to you the Vendrager family. Uh, Lord, we, we praise you that Mom Thelma had a faith in Christ, that you had a call on her life to welcome her home. But, Lord, we pray also for them as they walk through these days of making plans and walking through a funeral and the, the emotion of that loss. Lord, we pray that you would um, remind them of the comfort of belonging to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, so many people today are looking to belong. Lord, we pray that you would open doors here at Emmanuel in our church but, Lord, in our individual lives, to be open and ready to connect and to allow people to belong. But, Lord, we know that you have called us, each one of us, not because we're worthy or we're able or we're so strong or so talented. But, Lord, like you called the children and the weak and the weary, you call us to come and to find our place in your family because of what Jesus has done. So, Lord, we thank you again for what Jesus has done. We thank you for the opportunity to gather around the Lord's Supper and remember what Jesus did on the cross and look forward to a heavenly meal when, when your people will all gather together fully in your presence. Lord, we pray that we can proclaim this good news as a church, as individuals, with organizations we support. And Lord, we pray for this reign of Christ the King. Lord, that you would each day be working in our homes and in our communities to give life the shape of things to come, the life, the shape of things when, when your rule is unquestioned. And so, Lord, we uh, pray this morning for the ministry of love in the name of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for that ministry here in Sheldon and in O'Brien County. Um, Lord, helping members of churches to meet needs, teaching people skills that they need um, and can bless their lives, and Lord, also introducing them to Jesus, for it's love in your name. Lord, we pray this morning for justice for all as we have opportunity to receive an offering for their work. And Lord, we thank you for that organization out of Rock Valley and the, the work that they do too in meeting people's needs, both here and in many places throughout the nation. And Lord, as we also have an opportunity this morning to give for benevolence, we thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with many things, and we thank you that you have given us gifts which, which we may meet needs of, of those around us. Lord, whether part of our congregation or part of our broader community, 
And Lord, we pray that as we do that, we would meet those needs in the name of Jesus Christ, sharing the love of Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, as we bring our offerings to you this morning, we pray, Lord, that we might give joyfully. We pray, Lord, that you would use the offerings for benevolence to bless those in need, for justice for all to encourage and sustain their ministry. And Lord, the offerings for Emmanuel Church, that you would use us also to bless this community in your precious name. We, we offer these prayers to you in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As the deacons come and receive our morning offering, uh, the plates will be passed twice, the first time for uh, our tithes for Emmanuel and our offerings for Justice for All, and the second time is that benevolence offering that we take on a communion Sunday. And as they receive that offering, there's a song that's going to be going on. It's Here I Am. So and as we offer a bit of who we are through a financial gift, understanding what God is asking for is the whole of who we are to be ready to serve. Let's receive God's offering this morning.
to worship. Now, as we get ready to listen to our message, let us pray this prayer of wisdom together. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for your word, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Should take your Bible to and turn to Acts chapter 16. We're going to begin reading with verse 11. Acts 16, verses 11 through 40. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Thamothrace, Samothrace and the next day on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. 
At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men. The jailer told Paul, The magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly, without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and they threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. And the officers reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. Do you have any favorite travel stories? One of my family's favorite travel stories and one of my least favorite has to do with a GPS system, a six-lane road, and a very large truck. Trying to follow the GPS system, I might have got on the wrong three lanes of the six-lane road. And seeing the truck coming, took the curb, the 10-foot median, to get in the lanes going the right direction. Now, you know, every once in a while I tell stories about my family, I figured today I get to do it about myself. That's not a story that I actually like to repeat or have people know, but it's one of my family's favorites. So, yeah, we have travel stories. Today, we have a travel story of Paul and the other missionaries that are with him. And at this point, it's Silas, who has come from Jerusalem with that decree of the elders we talked about, and they're explaining this decree to the churches that Paul had gone on his first missionary journey to. They have Timothy, a young disciple from Lystra, and they have Luke, the writer of this book of Acts. And we know that Luke's with them because the language changed from they and them to we and us. Luke joined them. So they come to Philippi. Philippi is named after Philip of Macedon. If you know your history, that's the father of Alexander the Great. And this town of Philippi is very close to a battle that was fought after the death of Julius Caesar. Now, if you know your Shakespeare, Julius Caesar was stabbed by Brutus, right? A tu Brute? Brutus and Cassius? Well, good Romans. Brutus and Cassius raise an army, and they're going to take over the empire. And Caesar's chosen heir, his great nephew... Augustus or Octavian, and Mark Antony, they raise an army, but they don't fight in Rome, they fight over here by Philippi. And when Augustus and Mark Antony win the battle, well, you know what, there's all these Roman soldiers hanging around, and the Romans don't like armies coming home, because armies coming home are not loyal to the city, they're loyal to whoever the general was. So they make a wonderful Roman colony here in Philippi. So this, this city is full of Roman soldiers. And it's a very Roman place. Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, they come to Philippi, and when they come to Philippi, they realize that there is no Jewish synagogue there. Most of the time when Paul would go into a new town, he'd go to the Jewish synagogue the first time so he could preach with the background of, of the Old Testament, the background of God's word to his people Israel. And that would be the where he would start. But that meant that in this town, this big city of Roman city, there were less than 10 Jewish men of the age of 12 and above. That's what it took to found a synagogue. So, instead of going to the synagogue, they go to the place of prayer outside the river. Typically at, uh, well, typically at a river. And there were women who were gathered there. This is most likely the river as it looks today. And they found maybe some Jews, at least some god fearers people who they, weren't, they, they hadn't done everything to become a Jew, but they believed in the one God. And it's a small group. And I just want to take a quick note. 
sometimes Paul gets a bad rep. People think he's, he's hard on women. It didn't say there were any Jewish men there. It said, and they sat and they taught the women. Just a note before you, you take in some of that stuff. But the highlight of this is Lydia's conversion, right? So, and Luke, as he's writing Acts, he's actually giving us some typological pictures. Here's a Gentile woman of substance, actually a foreigner in Philippi. She's from Thyatira, and she is converted along with her household. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And here's a picture that we're going to see over and over again in this passage. Christ's, Christ's kingdom overcomes. The message of Jesus, gathering followers for King Jesus, overcomes the, the lack of a synagogue. It overcomes the barrier of race, of gender, of class. God's kingdom now includes a foreign female fabric merchant. And he opened her heart to respond, and she and the members of her household were baptized. And now in Acts, it's interesting. There are three responses for people when they, when they come to faith. One is the coming of the Holy Spirit. Two is they are overwhelmed by joy. And three is they immediately start showing hospitality. What does she do? Immediately she says, If you think I'm a believer, you come and stay at my house. So when we talk about the hospitality of welcoming people, the newcomer too, as soon as we are a follower of Jesus, it, it's up to us now to show that hospitality. So they're hosted by this new convert. And now I've used this word a couple times, and you guys who are counting your words on the bottom of the page, you have to decide. Are you just going to use the word uh, conversion, or are you going to count convert and converted? And are you counting? Are you marking them down really fast right now? So Lydia is converted. She's converted to what? She's converted to Christ's kingdom. Um, Christ's kingdom. Jesus' kingdom often called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, and, and Jesus uses that language throughout the New Testament. But it's funny for us in the United States. You know, we rejected the king. I mean, that was hundreds of years ago, and we don't, we don't like kings. But what does a king do? A king reigns over his subjects. He rules over his subjects. He's a king of those... Who, Jesus is the king of those who believe in him, who believe who he is, that he's the son of God, that he is the king, that he died on the cross, that he rose again. And to believe is to be loyal to him. So to convert is like changing nations. If uh, you were to move to Canada and become a Canadian citizen, you would, in making that move, claim the Queen of England as your queen. In becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, you are claiming a new king, a new citizenship. But that king, of course, has way more to do with your everyday life than the Queen of England does for a Canadian citizen. Jesus wants all of who we are. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is conversion. So we see a convert and several converts for it's her household, and we're sure that's not the end of it. And life is good for the missionaries. They're hosted at Lydia's house. They're having weekly meetings at the place of prayer. Knowing Paul, he's having conversations from place to place. Teaching from house to house. It says somewhere else. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Now, your translators have done you a favor here. It, in the Greek, it just says she had a python spirit. Most of us would read that and go, okay, she's got the spirit of a snake, so what? Uh, so your translators are actually doing you a little bit of a favor. But a python spirit, um, snakes in the Greek world were looked at as mystical creatures because they would go from below ground to above ground, the realm of death to the realm of life. And the, uh, the python was especially the, the snake of the god Apollo. Now, if you remember, uh, now, Apollo is the messenger god. Zeus is the high god. Apollo is the one that brings all of Zeus's messenger, messages out. And in a city called Delphi, which is a really interesting city, because there was no town there. I mean, I shouldn't even say, call it a city. It was a holy place. There was an athletic stadium. There was a theater, 
there were a whole bunch of temples and a whole bunch of other religious sets. And this is what's left of the Temple of Apollos. And at the Temple of Apollos was the Oracle of Delphi. And this was a big deal. If you could get a message from the Oracle of Delphi, this was a big thing. So people came from all over to this place that's up in the mountains, and you can't get to it, or you can't stay there very well because there's no city. So you've got to camp out. And they would come there to get their message from the gods. Well, now we're in Philippi. And here's a young lady walking around who has this python spirit, this spirit of being able to predict the future. She is making her owners a lot of money because people don't have to go all the way to Delphi to get their predictions. So she follows them day after day after day, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, telling you the way to be saved. That's great, right? Free advertising. Why does this trouble Paul? Why does it distress him so much? On one hand, this is not the right voice to be testifying. Uh, when Jesus confronted demons, they would recognize him. It wasn't unusual for a demon to recognize the real power of the kingdom of God. That's what's going on here too. But Jesus would silence them because he didn't want the demons to be the ones testifying to him. But there's also something else at work here. The oracles under the python spirit had this unique skill of presenting their messages in a way that could be easily misinterpreted. The most famous example is this. There's a great king with a huge army. He comes to the oracle seeking advice whether he should attack his neighboring king who also has a significant army. He says, tell me, oracle of Apollos, should I go to war against my enemy? Her reply, on the day you attack your enemy, a great army will be destroyed. That's good news, right? He goes to war. Okay, you guys can see the punchline coming. He goes to war and his own army is utterly destroyed. Now look at her words here in this passage. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now, we live in a Judeo-Christian background. We fill in the word Most High God with God, the Lord, Yahweh. Most of the people around there were believed in the Olympic gods. So who are they filling in this blank with? Zeus. They're telling you the way to be saved. Do you know who claimed the name Savior most often? The Roman Emperor. Augustus had fought a battle there. Now he died probably 30 years before, but he had fought a battle there. And Augustus had this whole... Um, campaign where he was proclaiming the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Now, there was a real thing. The Roman peace was a real thing, but it was also a propaganda campaign. And Caesar was the savior. He saved you from Brutus and Cassius, who were leading that other army. He saved you. He's the peace. He saved you from all the brigands around. He's saving you. So she could be proclaiming, here is salvation to eternal life in the one God through Jesus or she could just as well be proclaiming here's a way to a good life to be safe given to you by the emperor under the oversight of the God Zeus and so finally Paul says just be quiet of course that gets her into trouble I'm going to skip over that one today we talked about that last week. We talked about being saved. What is saved? Right with God. Saved from sin. Saved from the consequences of sin, which is hell. Saved to eternal life with God. So, maybe this uh, preaching, this woman following him around, shouting, is not as uh, helpful as possible. And so, through the power of the Holy Spirit... <coughs> Christ's kingdom overcomes the python spirit. And now the scene shifts. And the owners are angry, and they stir up the crowds, and they drag them down to the marketplace. Um, this is the, what the marketplace looks like now, but picture kind of um, Orange City, where they got the Central Park with everything around it, okay? And around the outside, you can kind of see where some of the columns are. There would have been shops all the way around the outside. Uh, there would have been altars to the gods in the middle. 
And somewhere in there, probably kind of on uh, what's the left side there, there was what they call the Bema. And a raised platform on which sat two magistrates, or strategoi. And the magistrates had, basically, it was their job to keep the peace. Remember, keeping the peace is a huge deal, right? The Roman peace. Augustine proclaimed the Roman peace. The emperors after him proclaimed the Roman peace. So you had to keep the peace. And what do the crowd say? These men are Jews. Well, we don't have very many Jews, so let's first of all, you know, play the ethnic race card, right? These men are Jews. They're advocating customs we're not, as Romans, supposed to do. Because, you know, then we can't do all of our sacrifices to the gods. But here's the big one. They're throwing our city into an uproar. They are disturbing the peace. Now, the truth is, they weren't really doing any such thing, right? They cast out one demon out of one slave girl. But you don't disturb the peace. And so these two magistrates have their two officers called lictors, and they have these lictors have the, their uh, symbol of office, which is a bunch of rods with an axe head coming out of it. And so they take out one of their rods each, and they beat Paul and Silas and throw them into prison. They're thrown into the deepest cell, put into stocks. But all of those precautions are fruitless against the power of Christ's kingdom, against Jesus' authority and power. These precautions are overcome. They're overcome by singing hymns and a prayer and an earthquake. Here's the sign of the Holy Spirit. There's the joy of the believers. They're singing hymns. Paul and Silas are not depressed, but they're praying, they're singing. And here's the earthquake, the power of God, and the whole situation. The Holy Spirit overwhelms this whole situation. The Holy Spirit is given to the believers, and Paul and Silas have joy. Through the Holy Spirit's power, the, the, the place is shaken, the doors are opened, the chains are taken off. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, hearts are opened, and there comes belief and conversion. And so then we move on. So at the beginning, we started with Lydia's conversion. We have all these troubles in the middle. And now to the end, we come to the jailer's conversion. And we see again the power of God's kingdom. Joy and conviction of Paul and Silas. The opening of shackles and doors was not for the purpose of escape because they stayed there. But it shows the power. If you look back earlier in Acts, you see that same thing. One time, Peter's thrown into the prison. And, oh, all of a sudden, he's out of prison. Another time, the apostles are healing, and they're thrown into prison, and the next day they're out in the temple courts preaching. They didn't run away, they didn't hide, but it's the power of God. So the Roman soul, or the, the jailer, a Roman soldier, brings them out. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How can I be converted? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God takes your sins, pays for your sins, raised from the dead, the King Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they believed. He converted. Jesus is now this man's king. And he demonstrates that he is now converted. He has given his life over to Jesus by, first of all, doing what? Showing hospitality. Paul and Silas are now hosted by this new convert. He cleans up their wounds. There's the water. And then the water is applied to him. He's baptized. And then what? He brings him into his house and shares a meal with them in the middle of the night. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then he was immediately, immediately he and his family were baptized. And the jailer brought them to his house and set a meal before them. And here's the other sign of the Holy Spirit. He was filled with joy. Because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. This time, Christ's kingdom overcomes the Roman culture, the military expectations that you're supposed to keep the prisoners incarcerated and make life difficult on them, the religious expectations of a, somebody who's solidly part of the Roman, um, Roman society, that you, you have the emperor cult and you have the sacrifices to all the Olympian gods, and the Holy Spirit overcomes all of this. Luke is showing us the spread of the gospel. Geographically, 
we went from Asia to Europe when we went across over to Macedonia. But here's a, a woman of substance. Luke's showing us a picture of a person that represents a whole group of people. And then we have a Roman soldier, jailer. Luke, again, showing us a picture that represents a whole group of people, that this kingdom of God is coming. And there are some implications for us today. First of all, the kingdom of heaven is broad. Okay? It recognizes no barrier of race or gender or class or economic status or intellectual or physical ability. We read in, in Galatians chapter 3, you are all sons. And now, I'm going to pause there. Sons, because that was the most privileged place in a patriarchal society. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For you are all baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is no bigger divide than Jew and non-Jew. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Slave nor free. Male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. So this kingdom of God, kingdom of Jesus Christ, is for you. It's broad. If you feel shut out, that's something people do. It's not God's way. If people aren't welcoming, that's not God's way. God does not shut people out except on the basis of their not believing who Jesus is and not giving their loyalty and devotion to him black or white, Hispanic or Asian, rich or poor, Republican, Democrat, female, male, long, lifelong believer or brand new comer to the faith. None of these things cuts you off from God's kingdom. You are welcome in his kingdom. And if you don't feel welcome here, shame on us. God sees us all as his most favored children. The kingdom is broad the kingdom of God overcomes. It's powerful. It overcomes all these barriers. It overcomes any of the efforts of mayors and presidents, of judges and dictators. It overcomes the forces of evil, the forces of other religions, the forces of our own stubbornness. Even our own sin and slavery to evils such as anger or drugs or violence or sex or selfishness or any evils done to us, abuse or violence or hatred. The Holy Spirit is the power of God to overcome all of these. And finally... God's kingdom is for you. It's broad enough for you. No category cuts you off. God's kingdom is grace-filled enough for you. No sin, no mistake of your past, no rebellion can cut you off from God and his love. God's kingdom is healing enough for you to overcome bitterness and hurt and anger and rage and desire for revenge. God's kingdom is inviting enough for you the doors are open and not closed. And remember, the, one of those first signs of becoming a follower of Jesus Christ was the hospitality. The new convert, Lydia, the new convert, the jailer, what's the first thing they do? They open their homes. Jesus also went to the home of a man named Zacchaeus. We sang about him today. He was a thief. He was a tax collector and taking as much as he could. And his heart was changed by Jesus. And the first thing he did, he opened his home and then he opened his wallet and started trying to give back what he had taken. This kingdom of God is for you. It's broad enough. It's powerful enough to overcome anything in our past or any barrier and it's open. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. He's my King. He died for me. And you will be saved. On that note, I want to move directly into the Lord's Supper today. So I invite the elders, if they would come forward. And we look at this supper. And we have bread. And we have juice. Because Jesus, in his last night before he died, he sat with his disciples. And they were celebrating what was called the Passover feast. It looked back into the history of God's people when God, by many miracles, brought his 
people out of slavery. And at that time, he did it with the blood of the lamb. And part of that feast was broken bread and cups. Cups that pointed to covenants. A covenant is an agreement, almost like a treaty. And that covenant was saying, I'm your God, you're my people, I'm taking you out of this slavery to another nation, to Egypt, and I'm bringing you out. And Jesus takes that old meal, and he uses it as a sign to point to what he is going to do on the cross. His body broken for us. His blood poured out for us. And as a seal, God putting his mark on this covenant. You are my people. I have claimed you for my own. And as we eat, we proclaim that because of Jesus' death, we've been invited to this table to be part of his family, gathered around that meal. And as part of his family, then we proclaim that in how we live and how we treat each other. In Romans 12, Paul says, Love must be sincere. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need practice hospitality. It's a table that God invites us to, and we're welcome because we're his daughters and sons, but it's a table where we are also brothers and sisters. Bless. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. The Lord says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when we were enemies, gave himself for us. In the meal, he feeds the hungry. He gives drink to the thirsty. He gives what we stand in need of. And as we come together around the meal today, we proclaim... We say, we believe in Jesus. We believe he died for us. We believe he was raised again. We believe that we will be invited to a heavenly banquet in his presence. We proclaim what he has done. But we also receive Jesus. As he says, this is my body. This is my blood. In a mysterious way through faith, we actually receive Christ and his presence and all his benefits to us. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for these gifts of bread and wine. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice to which they point. Lord, thank you for your eternal heavenly kingdom of which these are a foretaste. Lord, today, let us receive Christ and all his benefits. Amen. The bread that we break the symbol of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Take, eat, remember, and believe the precious body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for a complete forgiveness of all your sins. After supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave it to them and he said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me.
Take, drink, remember, and believe the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for a complete forgiveness of all your sins. Would you please stand? As you go out this week, the Lord goes with you. We have received Christ and all his benefits. One of those benefits is knowing that the Holy Spirit is with us each and every day. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Amen. Good. Mm-hmm.